Mr. Kant, uh, you know, you have been talking about uh, the G20 summit. Uh, what this audience would like to hear from you is some inside story into how you managed to bring those uh, rival cliques and if I can put it or warring groups uh, to finally have a declaration. You know, just minutes before that, you know, it was a nail biting suspense, like a thriller almost. Whether and everybody I remember, and I was there at Bharat Mandapam in the others, uh, this thing, was asking, will we have the declaration? And I told them, maybe because I had some idea of what Mr. Kant is about, that yes, we will have not only 100%, 200% declaration. Because you cannot allow the G20 to <laughs> fail. You cannot allow India G20 presidency to, uh, to fail. So I hand over to you, sir, over to you, uh, you uh, to deliver your keynote address on the subject uh, that is inclusive growth and rise of global south. Chancellor of JNU, Mr. Kamal Sibyl, uh, you know, he's been a, a, a very brilliant foreign secretary of India and I've greatly admired him earlier when he was ambassador of India in several countries. Uh, Professor Shrikanth Kondapalli, the Dean of the School of International Studies, JNU, uh, where I've been fortunate uh, to have studied when uh, from 76 to 78 when it was in the campus downstairs. This new infrastructure had not come up at that time. And uh, Mr. Manish Chand, who's organized this uh, uh, today's interaction, uh, the High Commissioner of uh, South Africa, uh, the Ambassador of Cuba, uh, uh, the Deputy High Commissioner of Eritrea, and many other distinguished uh, excellencies who are here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great uh, pleasure and a privilege for me to be here to speak on India's G20 and the Global South. Uh, one of the lasting images which will carry on forever to my mind of India's G20 presidency is the image of Prime Minister hugging the President of uh, Comoros and welcoming him as a permanent member, welcoming African Union as a permanent member of G20. By that one stroke, and it took a lot of work, it took almost about a year of work for India to be able to do that. There were several challenges because many other countries wanted ASEAN, many other people wanted other regional groupings, etc. But India stood firm. Uh, the Prime Minister had earlier held a meeting of the Voice of Global South. Their priorities became our priorities. And uh, uh, the Prime Minister then wrote to all the leaders saying that African Union must become a, a permanent member of India's G20. And with that one stroke, actually, India ensured that G20 became a far more inclusive uh, institution because it now covers almost about 90% uh, of the global population. It now covers almost three-fourths of the global trade. And uh, it has expanded into uh, a body which would now cover almost about uh, close to about 80% of the global population. So India has made G20 far more inclusive by doing that. But if there's one document in the history of multilateralism, which is a living, breathing uh, document of the global south, uh, which speaks the voice of the global south, and which uh, expresses the aspirations of the global south, it is the New Delhi Leaders Declaration. And this New Delhi Leaders Declaration is a very hard fought, very hard fought for someone who, has neg who negotiated this throughout. Let me tell you that it's a very, very hard fought victory for the Global South through the New Delhi Leaders Declaration. Every word in it, every letter in it, every sentence in it, every para in it, has been hard fought through the year for the sake of the Global South. And therefore, to my mind, uh, when we started our G20 presidency, there were several challenges around the world. Uh, if you look at the world, it was the post-COVID era. Uh, two 
uh, close to almost 200 million people had gone below the poverty line, almost 100 million people had lost their jobs. Uh, it was an era where uh, the world was getting into recession, one third of the world was already into recession, Germany has just got into recession, 75 countries of the world are facing a global debt crisis. There was a challenge of climate action and climate finance and on top of all this we had a raging war in Europe for over about almost a year and a half. So all these crises, uh, we took these crises as an opportunity and uh, as the Prime Minister said that our presidency at that time said that our presidency must be inclusive, it must be decisive, it must be ambitious and it must be action oriented. Now what we've done actually through this G20 presidency is to make it very uh, decisive, very inclusive very ambitious and very action oriented. If you look at the New Delhi Leaders Declaration, this is one declaration which has about 83 paras, it has 87 outcomes, it has about close to 112 odd documents attached to it, it has almost about 205 outcomes uh, in terms of outcomes and documents. Uh, no G20 declaration has so many outcomes and uh, annexed documents to it. Uh, this, all of them without any reservation, any dissent, any footnote, any uh, uh, objection from any country, these, are, these have all been arrived at a cons a cons through consensus. And by doing this, India has brought multilateralism center stage, uh, which was receding at one stage, we brought it back center stage, we brought uh, development of Global South center stage, we brought climate action and climate finance center stage, we brought uh, the reform of multilateralism, uh, of multilateral development banks and the multilateral financial architecture center stage, we brought uh, the technology uh, transformation and digital public infrastructure center stage, and more than anything else, we brought uh, that uh, women-led development, which is critical for the world center stage. But what India has demonstrated is that it is possible in today's world for an emerging market like India to bring uh, G7, uh, bring emerging markets, Russia, China, all center stage to the table and drive consensus in a highly divided world. And this is important, uh, that a country like India could bring everyone together and move forward for multilateralism's sake. And uh, if you look at it, if you look at our key priorities, I think the first and foremost, it's important because G20 is essentially an economic body, it's not a geopolitical body. The geopolitical body is the United Nations and the UN Security Council. G20 has grown and evolved from the finance minister and the central bank governors uh, forum. And in 2008, President Bush felt that today's world to drive acceleration of growth, you need the leaders to step in and therefore he made it evolve from finance minister and central bank governors to the leaders level in 2008. And since then it is being driven by the leaders. But the basic critical importance of G20 revolves around growth, development, etc. The developmental issues. But an uh, important issue of geopolitics like the Russia-Ukraine war has huge implication for food, fuel and fertilizer. And therefore in Indonesia last year it was felt that it is having severe impact on Europe in terms of the economy and therefore geopolitics was discussed and debated and it was also uh, its implication on economics was discussed and therefore geopolitical became center stage last year. So if you look at India's G20 politics, we focused on very strong, sustainable, inclusive growth first and foremost because in our view, 
growth is critical if growth is not able to take place in the world if we are not able to drive investments if we are not able to drive trade if we are not able to drive prosperity it will be very difficult to lift people above the poverty line and therefore we brought strong sustainable inclusive growth center stage and therefore a lot of discussion has taken place on aspects of growth particularly liberalization of trade this was important to do this because uh, if you look at the history of pandemics after pandemic there's normally a 5 to 6 years of protectionism and protectionism means a slow growth trade has lifted people above poverty line in india itself trade has lifted people above poverty line but if trade is there's a protectionism trend taking place across the world it will be very difficult to push trade and it will be very difficult to lift uh, emerging markets uh, to higher levels of growth trajectory and uh, therefore growth became center stage secondly we focused to my mind we focused very strongly on the global south now global south is important because Today, this particular year, 80% of the growth is coming from the Global South. And according to IMF and World Bank, 70% of the growth in the next two decades is going to come from emerging markets. So if growth is going to come from emerging markets for the next two decades, then you need to realign the multilateral financial institutions and the multilateral development banks to ensure that this growth gets accelerated. These institutions were designed in the post-World War II era, the post Bretton Woods period, and therefore they are not designed for climate action. They are not designed for sustainable development goals. They continue to do direct lending rather than do indirect lending. There's no shortage of resources in the world. There's $300 trillion available with private funds, almost $150 trillion available with sovereign wealth funds and with pension funds. But the risks of emerging markets are very different from the risks of developed world and therefore multilateral development banks need to bring new instruments of blended finance, of first loss guarantees, of credit enhancement to enable 10x more funding. They do 0.6 cents to a dollar lending. They are able to mobilize only 0.6 cents from the private sector to a dollar that they lend. Whereas they should be doing actually $10 to $1 that they lend. Now that is what India has brought center stage and said that we need to reform this. Secondly, the multilateral financial institution itself, the IMF, is heavily tilted in favor of the developed world. Inflation in America leads to rising of interest rates and that leads to resources flowing from the developing world to the developed world rather than resources flowing from the developed world to the developing world. And therefore, if you look at the last two years, resources have flowed from India to the developed world and not vice versa. That is the flaw of the international financial architecture. And that is what IMF has not been able to manage. Inflation in other parts of the world which has impacted emerging markets. And therefore one of our key priorities has been that we need to reform the multilateral development banks. We constituted a committee headed by Larry Summers of the Harvard and N.K. Singh which has made a clear roadmap for reforming these institutions. The third key priority for us was that sustainable development goals which are important for 2030 where the target year was 2030 instead of progressing we have regressed because of COVID and therefore uh, only 12% of the SDGs are on target we need to accelerate the pace of implementation so therefore we worked on a completely new action plan which became a part of our G20 leaders declaration and we said this action plan must be implemented by all the countries that has got accepted and now UN will push for that. Similarly, we push for a green development pact. We said yes, 
ग्रीन एक्शन इज नेसेसरी ग्रीन फाइनेंस इज नेसेसरी बिकॉज वील ऑल गो एक्सटिंग द अर्थ में सवाइव वील ऑल गो एक्सटिंग इफ वी आर नॉट एबल टू लिव अप टू वन पॉइंट फाइव डिग्री सेंटीग्रेड बट इफ यू लुक एट द टोटल कार्बन स्पेस नाइन्टी परसेंट ऑफ इट इज ऑलरेडी बीन ऑक्यूपाइड बाय द डेवलप वर्ल्ड देव लेफ्ट नथिंग फॉर डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज फॉर द ग्लोबल साउथ नथिंग इज लेफ्ट एंड देव फॉर वी सेड that countries like india which want to industrialize without carbonization would need more technology would need more finances to flow in and you need new instruments for that to happen and therefore we said that the multilateral development institutions must be restructured and reformed with a greater voice and a greater representation for the developing countries this is what g20 says greater voice and greater representation for the developing countries and therefore sdg acceleration is necessary green development pact is necessary green development pact talks about uh, tripling of renewable energy it talks about the biofuel alliance it talks about the green hydrogen alliance because even if we are able to do all our electricity as yes, renewable 80% of our energy is all hard to abate sectors like refinery fertilizer steel cement all this requires uh, we use india uses 200 billion worth of fossil fuel imports to be able to uh, uh, push for all this refinery but this is all imported fossil fuel now our aim is that by 2047 we should actually become an exporter of energy instead of being an importer of energy but to be able to do that you can you have to use your climatic condition which is probably the best and all the global south have the best climatic conditions they should be able to produce renewables crack water produce green hydrogen and actually replace fossil fuel by green hydrogen and that is that would require size and scale would require resources to flow in all that we've pushed for in the green uh development pact we push for oceans we push for plastics we push for many circular economy many things in the green development pact and this is the first time the world has pushed for a green development pact amongst the leaders we then pushed for so if you look at our priorities it was strong sustainable inclusive growth it was accelerated sustainable development goals it was green development pact it was reform the multilateral institutions and then the fifth key priority for us was technological transformation and digital public infrastructure because in the midst of covid climate action one thing that has stood out is the digital public infrastructure because we've demonstrated like in many other countries like brazil uh kenya many other countries digital public infrastructure during the covid period were able to ensure that we are able to provide direct benefit transfer to citizens we are able to provide covid vaccination to citizens which was ca- cashless and paperless in india we have been able to provide digital identity for all our citizens 1.4 billion we been able to provide bank accounts between 2015 to 2017 we opened 500 million bank accounts we linked them up with identity and with mobile number and today we use our mobile to do all our fast payments we do 11x more fast payments than what america and europe do we do 4x more than china so if you look at the last two decades most of the technological developments have happened in the western part of the world because of big tech it's happened because of microsoft it's happened because of facebook it's happened because of google apple and in china because of tencent and alibaba but india has demonstrated a different model and that is the public interest layer of providing digital identity on top of which the private sector innovates and competes so in india phone pay competes with google pay paytm competes with whatsapp there are 40 different apps competing and actually they are doing about 11 billion transactions a month and from transaction then there are many other startups like lending card pine labs all of them do cashless paperless lending and then you have a new set of startups like zeroda grow upstart they are all unicorns which then do uh wealth creation they have taken stock market to tier 2 tier 3 uh 
uh, rural areas and today they hold about 40% of the stock market share because they are doing cashless paperless wealth creation. And then you have another set of startups like Digit and Aco which provide insurance on your mobile on the go. And when I was a young officer, it used to take me six months to get an insurance, paperwork. Now they do cashless, paperless on the mobile, all this. Now all this has happened because of digital public infrastructure. Now, but if you look at the world today, there are four billion people who do not have a digital identity. There are three billion people who do not have a bank account. There are 133 countries who do not have uh, digital fast payments. So the model that the Global South has built up the digital public infrastructure which is low cost, which is open source, open API, interoperable, needs to be taken to all these countries so that we are able to do direct benefit transfer. In India, we, during COVID, we provided uh, money to the bank accounts. Instead of giving large packages, we provided money straight into the bank accounts of beneficiaries of 800 million people without any leakage. We today provide 700 schemes of the government. We put money straight into the beneficiaries without any leakage. There's not a single pass of leakage. And therefore, we become productively a more efficient economy. And that's the model which needs to be taken to the rest of the world so that we are able to lift vast segments of population above the poverty line. And the last key priority for us was women-led development, which is important because 50% of the population in the world is women and you cannot drive growth, you cannot reach SDGs, you cannot transform lives till you are not able to put women into position of leadership, you are not able to empower women, you are not able to ensure gender equality. Uh, one of the studies by World Economic Forum says that it will take 132 years to achieve gender equality. We do not have 132 years, we need to do it in the next decade. And therefore, women-led development, this is the most profound statement anywhere written on women empowerment, gender equality, women-led development, and we fought our way through because many countries opposed women-led development. And we fought our way through till the end to ensure that this figured very prominently. And therefore, this has been a crowning glory for New Delhi leaders' declaration that we focus very strongly on women empowerment and gender equality and women-led development in this. <coughs> but one of the key challenges, uh, if you look at why we said that Global South was important for us was, as I said, growth is coming from the Global South. And six of the fastest growing 12 countries in the world are from Africa. If we are not able to provide adequate resources to these countries, you will see a slowdown of growth. You need to transform lives of citizens. It has to be an equitable world. You cannot have growth in one part of the world and inequality in other parts of the world. And therefore, for us, Global South was very important. But one of the key challenges which India faced in, during this presidency was to be able to arrive at a final agreement. Everything hinged around several challenges. One was that 14 uh, ministerials had failed. We could not arrive at a consensus. And therefore, we had to finally arrive at a consensus in the leaders summit which is the Sherpa meeting. There were challenges on the climate, there were challenges on the energy, there were challenges even on the finance track. So we had about 15 such issues on which consensus had to be built up. Now we held about close to 32 virtual meetings of Sherpas and we had cleared up 90% of the draft. But the balance 10% was all critical. It was climate, it was energy, it was finance. And then it was the critical issue of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So when we started meeting and the leaders summit was on 9th and 10th and we met on 2nd, we decided not to have the meeting in Delhi. We took the Sherpas about 65 kilometers away in uh, in the new district of Haryana in classic ITC Classic, where, which is about 65-70 kilometers away. We just locked them up so that we could arrive at a consensus. And we started negotiating many of these paras. And we, while we were doing this, we started the Russia-Ukraine discussion. 
and I'll give you a little bit of a challenge since Mr. Manish Chand wanted me to tell you about what how this uh, agreement was arrived at. So, uh, because the uh, the dis the Russia Ukraine para which was discussed in Bali was a divided para. It had spoken about some countries felt this, few countries felt this, many countries felt this. It was a split para. Our objective here was that we that para had broken down from the very within 30 days of the Bali summit. Our challenge was to have a consensus para which could stay forward for the future. And therefore, when we started discussing it on second morning, we first faced you challenges in the sofa talk. But then I, dis I dictated out the basic principles of what should figure in that draft, 15 basic principles. Then I asked everybody else to add on to that. USA added, China added, uh, G7 added, emerging markets added, all of them added. Uh, Russia added, China added, they had many extreme views, extreme views, but we put it all together and at the end of it all we had about close to 40 principles on, around which we worked. We gave them the first draft, next day morning we worked overnight, gave them the next draft. And then we, ev every draft kept failing. So we had about 16 drafts which failed, 16 drafts which failed. But after every draft, within one hour of that, we'd come out with an alternative draft. We knew the red line of every country. We, had, we did about 300 hours of negotiation. We had about 250 bilateral meetings. So we knew, we knew exactly what are the red lines of every country. Within the G7 also, there were differences. So we kept covering the red lines and we kept arriving, we kept pushing back. A great negotiation is one where you push back everybody. You know, everybody is talking of the extreme. You're pushing back G7. You're pushing back Russia. You're pushing back China. You're pushing back everyone. So that a common consensus language can be arrived at. And we fought it all out in the bilateral meetings. And then on 8th morning, we gave them the 16th draft in ITC Classic. And after... Two hours of discussion, we started at about 8.30 in the morning, by 10.30 that had failed. Now, the leaders had already started arriving. The leaders had already started arriving. All through we had said that nobody could take a photograph. We did not give them a paper document. Nothing was given to them. They could just read because if anything had leaked out, we had not allowed press, we had not allowed New York Times, Washington Post, it Italian, German channels to come inside that meeting hall or to get inside ITC Classic. So we kept the pace and 8th eight, morning it failed. And then I said we'll start the meeting in New Delhi in Shushma Swaraj Bhavan at about close to 4.30. So 4.30 we all again met. From 4.30, I knew the challenge was Russia, so 4.30 to 6.30, I had a dis first a discussion with Russia. We started our meeting at 7, and 7 again, uh, we discussed several issues. It was like a sofa talk discussion, and I said, I'll come back with a draft. I took it to Brinkmanship, I took it to about 11.30 in the night. At 11.30, I gave them the 17th draft, and I said, this is it. This is the draft. I know the red lines of everyone. I've taken care of every single country. This is the final draft. Either you take it or you leave it. And if, you, if any leader feels strongly that this is not acceptable to your country, please ask your leader to discuss with my prime minister tomorrow morning. But this is the para I will green tomorrow morning. And I will green it. And if anybody has any objection, please ask your leader. No, more, no further discussion at the Sherpa level. And I walked out of that room. <laughs> I came out to my room and then the Russian Sherpa uh, walked in with his minister. There's one Mr. Pankin who's the minister of state for foreign affairs. He came to my room and he wanted the word sanctions to be put into that declaration. For two hours we discussed with him and we had to finally tell him that if you insist on this we'll make it 19-1 isolate Russia. And the second thing we had to tell them that if you do not agree uh, we have avoided uh, you know, in Indonesia, they got Mr. Zelensky to speak virtually and said, "We there's huge pressure on us from G7. And if you do not 
If you do not agree, not only will we make it 19-1, tomorrow morning after our Prime Minister has spoken, we'll get Mr. Zelensky to speak, virtually. And we said this, uh, and, and he'll be the next speaker after that. <laughs> and that meeting we ended at that and within 15 minutes of that we got the consent of Russia. <laughs> so, we, by, by morning 5.36 on my mobile I had got the consent of all G7. France, Germany, Italy, all of them had given the consent but I had not got the consent of USA. Now, at about 6.30, the meeting was to start at 9 o'clock. At 6.30, I called the American Sherpa and asked him uh, that I've got the consent of all emerging markets. And the reason why we got the consent of all these G7 was because the reason was that we had all worked together. The emerging markets had all worked together. The draft we had put together was in the name of India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia. And we were backed by Mexico, Argentina, uh, Saudi, Turkey, all together. So we had nine countries backing us. Now, when I phoned up the American Sherpa, he said that uh, we are discussing, I'll call you up in about half an hour. He got back to me after half an hour. They discussed with their president. They said, uh, we'll agree to this, but we have two conditions. One word we would like to be changed, which was, he's, he said one particular word he'd like to be changed. And he said that we'll agree only if Russia and China agree. So Russia had already agreed. There was no challenge. In the morning, I'd got their written consent. Now, so I, that one word we debated and finally said we'll agree to cha trans change it. But then uh, we had not got the consent of China. When I got back to China at about 7.45 in the morning, the Chinese Sherpa told me, that Mr. Kant, we'll, we have no problem with this para, we'll agree to this para, but we'll agree to it only if there's another challenge. We have a bilateral challenge with the United States. We had agreed that the 2026 G20 will be held in the United States of America. And he said that these Americans, while we have greened it, my prime minister who has come does not agree to it, that should be changed, then we'll agree to it. So I, I talked to the Americans, they said, no, it's a prestige for us, it can't be changed now, 2026. So the Chinese said they don't give us visas. They don't give us visas to us, to Hong Kong people, to the governor of Hong Kong, they don't give visas. So they, we will never agree unless they don't give us a written guarantee. So the meeting started. And then from, I took the American Sherpa and the Chinese Sherpa in the neighboring room, in the leader's room for two, for two and a half hours from 9.30 to 12, we negotiated. And finally, instead of a guarantee, we got a letter from America that they will issue a visa. They said that we'll ensure that visas are issued to all legitimate, uh, 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 legitimate uh, representatives of China and Hong Kong and all that. And uh, we got them this letter. And that's how we, 12.15, we finished it off. And by 1 o'clock, we got the Prime Minister to announce that the declaration is through. So this was the backstage negotiation which went on throughout. Now, uh, it was a it was lot of brinkmanship. It was taking it to an extreme, pushing them hard, pushing all countries. We pushed USA back, we pushed, we pushed all G7, we pushed France back, we pushed Germany back. They had a lot of differences among themselves also. We pushed uh, Russia back, we pushed China back, everyone, all of them we pushed back to be able to arrive at a consensus language which is accepted. Uh, we achieved success where United Nations and United Nations Security Council have not been able to achieve success. That has been the level of success. On all 83 paras we've achieved success. And that's how we've done it. Uh, uh, we've done it so it, it demonstrates India's great ability. We could achieve success because we worked with the Global South. We could achieve success because we worked with all the emerging markets. We could achieve success because we were bold, gutsy, courageous, and we could took, take the risk. Otherwise, this would not have been possible. We could achieve success because we had the full backing of our leader, that is the Prime Minister. We had full success because his stature, his standing, his clout mattered a lot. And therefore, we could take the risk and push things hard and get a full consensus on this document. And that's how we achieved a consensus on the New Delhi Leaders Day. Thank you very much.